Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 19 Another summer had come, and still I had not speared the giant devilfish that lived near the cave. Every day during the spring, Rantu and I went to look for him. I would put the canoe in the water and paddle slowly through the cave, from one opening to the other, often several times. I saw many devilfish there where the black water is streaked with light, but not the giant one. At last, I gave up looking for him and began to gather abalones for winter. The red shells hold the sweetest meat and are best for drying, though the green ones and the black are also good. Because the red ones are the sweetest, sweetest starfish prey upon them. This star-shaped creature places itself over the shell of an abalone. With its five arms spread out against the rock to which the abalone is fastened, it holds the shell with its suckers and then begins to lift itself. The starfish pulls against the abalone shell, sometimes for days, holding on with its suckers and pushing up with its legs, until little by little the heavy shell comes loose from the body. One morning we left the cave and paddled out to the reef, which is joined to it. For many days I had been gathering a few shellfish on the rocks at Coral Cove, but I had been watching the reef and waiting for the right time to harvest. This is when there are few starfish feeding, for they are as hard to pry loose from an abalone as an abalone is to pry from a rock. The tide was low and the reef rose far out of the water. Along its sides were great numbers of red abalones and very few starfish. So before the sun was high, I filled the bottom of the canoe. The day was windless, and since I had all I could carry, I tied the canoe and with Rantu following me, climbed onto the reef to look for fish to spear for our supper. Blue dolphins were leaping beyond the kelp beds, and the kelp otter were playing at the games they never tired of, and around me everywhere the gulls were fishing for scallops, which were numerous that summer. They grow on the floating kelp leaves, and there were so many of them that much of the kelp near the reef had been dragged to the bottom. Still, there were scallops that the gulls could reach, and taking them in their beaks, they would fly far above the reef and let them drop. The gulls would then swoop down to the rocks and pick the meat from the broken shells. Scallops fell on the reef like rain, which amused me, but not Ron too, who could not understand what the gulls were doing. Dodging this way and that, I went to the end of the reef where the biggest fish live. With a snoo line and a hook made of abalone shell, I caught two that had large heads and long teeth but are good to eat. I have one I gave one to Ron to, and on the way back to the canoe gathered purple sea urchins to use for dyeing. Rantu, who was trotting along in front of me, suddenly dropped his fish and stood looking down over the edge of the reef. There, swimming in the clear water, was the devil fish. It was the same one I had been hunting for. It was the giant. Seldom did you see any devil fish here, for they like deep places, and the water along this part of the reef is shallow. Perhaps this one lived in the cave and came here only when he could not find food. Rantu made no sound. I fixed the head of the spear and the long string that held it to my wrist. I then crawled back to the edge of the reef. The giant had not moved. He was floating just below the surface of the water, and I could plainly see his eyes. They were the size of small stones and stood out from his head, with black rims and gold centers, and in the centers a black spot like the eyes of a spirit I had once seen on a night that rain fell and lightning forked in the sky. Where my hands rested was a deep crevice, and in it a fish was hiding. The giant was half the length of my spear from the reef, but while I watched, one of his long arms ran out like a snake and felt its way into the crevice. It went past the fish and along the side of the rock, and then the end of it curled back. As the arm gently wound itself around the fish from behind, I rose to one knee and drove the spear. I aimed at the giant's head, but though it was larger than my two fishes and a good target, I missed. The spear struck down through the water and slanted off. Instantly, a black cloud surrounded the devil fish. The only thing I could see of him was one long arm still grasping his prey. I jumped to my feet to pull in the spear, thinking that I might have a chance to throw it again. 
As I did so, the shaft bobbed back to the surface, and I saw that the barbed point had come loose. At the same moment, the string tightened, my grip on the grip on it broke, and aware that I had struck the devil fish, I quickly dropped the coils I held. For when the string runs out fast, it burns your hands or becomes entangled. The devil fish does not swim with fins or flippers like other things in the sea. He takes water in through the hole in the front of his body and pushes the water out behind through two slits. When he is swimming, slowly, you can see these two streams trailing out, but only then. When he moves fast, you can see nothing except a streak in the water. The coils I had dropped on the rock hopped and sang as they ran. Then there was no more of them. The string tightened on my wrist, and, to lessen the shock, I leaped across the crevice in the direction the giant had taken. With the string in both hands, but still fastened to my wrist, I braced my feet on the slippery rock and leaned backwards. The string snapped tight with the weight of the devil fish. It began to stretch, and fearing that it might break, I walked forward, yet I made him pull me every step. He was moving toward the cave, along the edge of the reef. The cave was a good distance away. If he got there, I would surely lose him. The canoe was tied just in front of me. Once I was in it, I could let him pull me until he grew tired, but there was no way to untie the canoe and still hold on to the string. Rantu, all this time, was running up and down the reef, barking and leaping at me, which made my task harder. Step by step, I walked forward until the devil fish was in the deep water close to the cave. He was so close that I had to stop, even if the snoo broke and I lost him. I therefore braced myself and did not move. The snoo stretched, throwing off drops of water. I could hear it stretch, and I was sure it would break. I did not feel it cutting into my hands, though. They bled. The pull suddenly lessened, and I was sure that he was gone. But the next instant, I saw the string cutting the water in a wide circle. He was swimming off from the cave and the reef toward some rocks that were about twice the length of the string away. He would be safe there, too, for among them were many places to hide. I pulled in half the string while he was moving toward the rocks, but soon had to let it out. It grew tight and again began to stretch. The water here was only a little over my waist, and I let myself down over the reef. There was a sandbar not far from the rocks, and stepping carefully on the bottom, which was full of holes, I slowly made my way toward it. Rantu swam along by my side. I reached the sandbar before the devil fish could hide himself in the rocks. The string held and he turned about and once more swam toward the cave. Twice again he did this. Each time I took in some of the string. The third time, as he came up into the shallow water, I walked backward across the sandbar so he would not see me and pulled on the string with all my strength. The giant slid up on the sand. He lay with his arms spread out partially in the water, and I thought he was dead. Then I saw his eyes moving. Before I could shout a warning, Rantu had rushed toward, forward and seized him, but the devil fish was too heavy to lift or shake. As Rantu's jaws sought another hold, three of the many arms wound themselves around his neck. Devil fish are only dangerous in the water, where they can fasten themselves to you with their long arms. These arms have rows of suckers underneath them, and they can drag you under and hold you there until you drown. But even on the land, the devil fish can injure you, for he is strong and does not die quickly. The giant was flailing his arms, struggling to get back into the water. Little by little, he was dragging Rantu with him. I can no longer use the string because it was wound around Rantu's legs. The whalebone knife I use for prying abalones from the rocks was tied to a thong at my waist. The blade was thick at the point, but it had a sharp edge. I dropped the coils of string and unfastened the knife as I ran. I ran past the devil fish and got between him and the deep water. So many of his arms were flailing that it was useless to cut any one of them. One struck me on the leg and burned like a whip. Another, which Rantu had chewed off, lay wriggling at the edge of the water as if it were looking for something to fasten onto. The head rose out of the twisting arms like a giant stalk, 
the gold eyes with their black rims were fixed on me. Above the sound of the waves and the water splashing and Rantu's barking, I could hear the snapping of his beak, which was sharper than a knife I held in my hand. I drove the knife down into his body, and as I did this I was suddenly covered, or so it seemed, with a countless number of leeches sucking at my skin. Fortunately, one hand was free, the hand that held the knife, and again and again I struck down through the, through the tough hide. The suckers, which were fastened to me and pained greatly, lessened their hold. Slowly the arm stopped moving and then grew limp. I tried to drag the devil fish out of the water, but my strength was gone. I did not even go back to the reef for my canoe, though I did take the shaft and the head of the spear, which had cost me much labor, and the canoe line. It was night before Rantu and I got back to the house. Rantu had a gash on his nose from the giant's beak, and I had many cuts and bruises. I saw two more giant devilfish along the reef that summer, but I did not try to spear them. <laughs>